Now it is my great honor and great pleasure to introduce the Von Hippel Award recipient. She doesn't need any introduction at all. Is Professor Mildred Dreslaus from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and the Von Hippel Award citation reads as, for her pioneering contributions to the fundamental science of carbon-based and other low electron density materials, her leadership in energy and science policy, and her exemplary mentoring of young scientists. Mildred is an institute professor at the, Univers at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and recent research activities in the Dresslaus group that have attracted wide attention worldwide are in the areas of carbon nanotubes, bismuth nanowires, and low dimensional thermoelectrics. Her research in material physics and her public service have been widely recognized. Dresslaus has received numerous awards, including the National Medal of Science, the Fermi Award, the Kavli Award, and 30 honorary doctorates worldwide. She is particularly well known for her work on carbon nanotubes and other nanostructure systems. Also, we know that Millie was the first single winner of the Kavli Award in nanoscience. All previous awards were joint winners. So please, join me in welcome Professor Milly Dresslaus. Thank you so much for that lovely welcome. Uh, this is a particularly uh, lovely award for me because of my long-term friendship with Arthur von Hippel. And I'm going to start out my talk by telling you a little bit about him because not too many of you have ac actually known him and why we honor him so much with this award every year. For 40 years now, we have spoken about him and what he's done for material science. So there's a picture of me and Arthur von Hippel. Uh, taken when he was, I believe, 75 years old. That's, I'm not exactly sure, but I believe that we used to have a lot of birthdays for him. And uh, so, a little bit about uh, Arthur von Hippel. Uh, as you know, he was a war refugee, but he actually came before the war started, but because of troubles in Europe in the 1930s. And uh, he wound up at MIT after a kind of a circuitous journey to get to the U.S. and became professor uh, of electrical engineering, of all things. Uh, but he was really a scientist interested in all aspects of materials. So that's kind of what we know him for. He had broad views of materials. He was interested in all kinds of materials, from the most uh, fundamental issues to uh, practical applications. Um, during World War II, he was a leader in radar research and the role of materials. And um, after the uh, radar program was, was finished, World War II was finished, he remained uh, on the faculty at, at MIT. He was there before, but he remained. And um, I got to know him when I arrived uh, at MIT in 1960. And at that time, uh, he was in the peak of his career. 
Yes, he was 62 years old, but he worked for a very long time because he lived to 105 years old. And uh, he was active well up in his 90s. So I tell you more about that. So this is me back, well, this is not a long time ago. Because I couldn't find a picture in the archives, but there, there should be many pictures. Uh, because they used to snap them, but uh, you know we didn't have the kind of uh, equipment as we had today. So uh, this is an ersatz picture. Of, uh, but um, I was a member of his quartet. You see, you have to understand that Arthur von Hippel was a man of great culture, and uh, attached to his research group, there was a string quartet. And uh, the person that organized it, uh, the string quartet, was the person that took care of all the publications that were done by the Von Hippel group. And that was Joe Stein. And anybody that knows about chamber music will know about Joe Stein because he's a very important person in that area. So I was a friend of Joe Stein's, a friend of the Von Hippel's, and I was part of the, his quartet. And uh, so we played something. We had a co little concert for the big birthdays, 75, 80, 90, those, those kind of things. And the 90th birthday was the last big one. And um, the 100th birthday was more of a private event. And after that, we sort of stopped doing birthday parties uh, so seriously. But um, I, we still remember his broad interests and his uh, influence on all people that associated with him. So we all have mentors, um, uh, and he fits into that uh, a category for me. So undergraduate, I had a great mentor, Rosalind Yellow. She was my teacher and got me into um, interest in science and career in doing that sort of thing. And then graduate student, I, I was under the influence of Enrico Fermi. So oh, that was a great mentor. And uh, then when I started my in independent career, I had Arthur von Hippel. So I've done pretty well with my mentors. And so what, a few things about uh, Arthur von Hippel. He liked interesting topics. He liked complicated materials. He was an expert in perovskites and ferroelectrics. And that was kind of uh, complicated at that time. You know, nowadays it, we don't, wouldn't think it's complicated. But he also liked simple fundamental systems. And um, he encouraged me, my early career, to, to work on uh, graphite. And I was doing uh, high magnetic field studies, and he thought that that was very interesting to, uh, as a way to uh, uh, understand electronic properties. And um, also teach students about fundamentals. He thought that that was really important. And um, I was brought to MIT to teach uh, uh, physics and science engineering students. And, that, and that's been my whole career, really. Uh, the dean liked it, and Arthur, who uh, liked it, so a lot of people liked it. And uh, what I say in the bottom is that he was very encouraging to young people. So mentors and encouragement is really important, and I think the Materials Research Society does a good job in honoring that um, aspect of him. So this is the citation, which you've already heard. And I'll be talking about the beginning part about it, uh, research in carbon-based materials, not too much about um, uh, low electron density materials, although I, I do that, and thermoelectrics was introduced, I do that too. But um, we have to keep it simple and concise, so I just limit myself to one uh, topic. And so, uh, so my, my story com comes uh, out like this. When I first uh, arrived as the, um, my independent career, 
I was informed to work on something that was interesting, interesting to me, and something that people didn't know anything about. So that was the 1960s. Work on topics that people don't know about, and uh, carbon science had um, essentially nobody working in there. So von Hippel thought that was a pretty good topic to be working on. And he encouraged me in my early career to uh, work on this. So here you see um, linear E versus K. So that's what attracted me, different from ordinary semiconductor people doing silicon, gallium arsenide, that kind of stuff, uh, three, five compounds. And I was just doing something else. And so this is how I got into the carbon world, by being different. And uh, so I started right down here at the beginning of time here in 1960, my, my career. Then. And the number of papers per year were like two or three. And uh, they often had the name Dressel House on them. And th there's some advantage of being uh, um, alone in a field. I know it's your work and uh, people uh, think well of uh, starting something new, but then not very many people read it either because uh, there's no interest, so you, you're, you're a little bit unknown. But with time, you see, uh, this thing caught on, and now, nowadays we have uh, very uh, large numbers of papers published, so many that you can't read them all. So uh, the field has certainly uh, progressed. And um, what, what do people see in this? Um, well, it's something similar to what I saw, that these carbon materials are different from other things. And if you um, uh, attended some of the uh, sessions, uh, symposia here, that are related, because there uh, are several in this area, um, you'll understand that these systems are uh, do behave differently, the science is different, and the hope is someday there'll be some applications that are useful and, and valuable. Um, I, I might mention that um, about von Hippel and applications, um, he was very much interested in al applications even though he did basic science. And uh, uh, he, he always felt that there should be some kind of application at the end uh, that people care about. So, and so, okay, so I, I started my early work. Um, so, this is my uh, work in the 1960s, uh, work at high magnetic fields, and I was studying these magnetic energy levels um, in a system. So, why carbon? See, carbon has these very light carriers. So magnetic energy levels could be separated by fairly large energy separation, so you could measure them quite accurately. So that was the attraction. And um, what we, the most interesting thing that we did in the period of the 1960s with carbon was identify uh, what were the holes and what were the electrons. We started working on this system the holes and electrons were mislabeled. And what we know today as the electrons used to be called holes and vice versa. So how did this happen? Well, if you do a circularly polarized experiment, there's a chirality dependence. So we know about chirality in nanotubes, but there's chirality in this as well. And so these were the first experiments done with circularly polarized laser ra radiation. So, in fact, this is the first laser experiment uh, done in magneto optics. To, uh, and uh, so, Ali Javan, the uh, inventor of the CW laser, built a special laser for this experiment. And so, we, we were collaborators on this that made right and left circularly polarized light. And then we could tell which, what were the chiralities. So that was, um, and um, that labeled electrons and holes in the Berwan zone. So that was kind of the first uh, uh, decade of activities. So of course, when you know the electrons and holes, then you can build up the Fermi surface. You can understand all the different properties. 
understand doping and all of these kinds of things. So this is kind of a basis to take off of what happened to the um, carbon, um, simple carbon system, bulk, three-dimensional. But we always were thinking back about uh, the 1947 paper of Wallace with linear E versus K and how could we get closer to that. So uh, I was invited in the 1960s to Bell Labs and there there was a very interesting con conversation um, that uh, maybe it would be interesting to look with a magneto optics of an intercalation compound. And uh, that was encouraged because people at Bell Labs had found superconductivity in materials where the ingredients had nothing to do with superconductivity. So uh, what they had was C8K. So that's carbon and potassium. Well, there's nothing that seems like a superconductor there, an alkali metal and carbon. So you put them together, you made a layer compound and go superconducting. How come? What's going on? So uh, magneto-optics is kind of a very nice tool to understand about electrons and their transport. So that got us started in uh, working on um, intercalation compounds. See, with intercalation compounds, we could have single layers of carbon. We could have two layers, we could make bilayers, and so on. Of course, they had spacers between them, and of course, nowadays we don't need this. But people nowadays are making materials that are like this with few layers, very similar to this. So uh, there's a, a current analog of this field um, that's doing rather well. But back then, this was the way we could study something about um, uh, single layers. And I want you to observe that stage one means just one carbon layer, and stage two, two carbon layers, stage three, four, five, multiple. One layer is different than two, three, four, five, six. So it's very interesting. How come? And uh, so that's somewhat connected with linear E versus K. Uh, not only can make uh, uh, donor compounds, you can make acceptor compounds, you can put molecules between the layers. And what was interesting about that is when you put molecules, you could see how molecules change their properties. Nowadays, people do put mole molecules on graphene, and we study the effect of the molecules on graphene and we also study a little bit, but maybe not as much as we might, study the effect of the graphene on the molecules. So, uh, and so th that idea came from this early work, and I think it has a current analog with the um, work going on. So that's work in the 1970s. Now I'm going to move on to what we were doing in the 1980s. So. Uh, Science doesn't stand still, and uh, people started taking these carbon surfaces and taking a laser and firing a laser on the surface and see what happens. That's a good, good thing to do. It's a curiosity. Um, what do you think happens? So we, we expected C2 to come off, C3, something like that. But big chunks of stuff came off. And so that was these clusters. And the clusters, when we figured out how big they were, they were pretty big. And uh, that led through a series of trips and discussions to moving into this regime of, of heavier uh, sizes on the clusters. Uh, we weren't mass spectroscopists, so other people took over this work right away. And, um, and then we had fullerenes. And uh, it was the Rice group that really did the best work on this. This is a picture of Forerunner with Exxon, and then uh, comes the fullerene decade. And um, so we got into the fullerenes, and that's a book 
written for students, it was hard for students to understand all the symmetry that happens to this icosahedral thing because icosahedral symmetry was not in the textbooks yet. So we wrote a book on fullerenes that was a lot of fun for the authors and the students that were in the classroom. So, uh, and spectroscopy about the fullerene was so interesting because it had so much symmetry and you could identify exactly which atoms were moving and which direction they were moving and polarization effects and all of that. And with high resolution, you could do all these combination modes. We had 200 combination modes that were infrared and Raman active with the identific identification of all the symmetry types. That was really a uh, tour de force for uh, the students in the group theory class. So that's what we uh, uh, tortured the students with in the classroom at that, in, the, in this period. Uh, also in the 1980s, we were uh, studying, we had to do some practical things, and that goes back to von Hippel. You know, we should, and that was carbon nanotubes. The government was interested in using carbon nanotubes for various practical applications. And there was really no good source of information that was organized and scientific about them. So the army got after uh, us here at MIT and asked us if we could write a, a book to help people, or at least class notes or something, to help people who had to work on this for applications that were of interest to the government. So this book uh, came uh, into creation. Uh, and writing books is very nice uh, exercise for students. Uh, they get lots of um, uh, problem sets that get generated when you write books. And it's uh, uh, a pleasant for the uh, teacher and for the students. So, okay, so we became experts in carbon fibers for a while. And um, as a result of this book, and, um, and Smalley was out there with his fullerenes. And we had a conference, 1991, I guess the conference was. 1990, something like that. And uh, he was invited, to, Smalley was invited to talk about C60, and I was invited to talk about these fibers. And then somebody asked us, what has, what's the commonality between these two? And so, well, we didn't know, but we suggested, okay, maybe uh, this could be thought of as a, some kind of structure like that. And you take C60, 60, you elongated to C70. That was known already. So why not keep going? C80, 100. So there it is drawn with hexagons. And then eventually you get something that's really long. Well, that's, you know, that's something you could talk about in, in, in the whimsy, you know, to people. But uh, it, would this be interesting? Well, just about the time that, we, that uh, this discussion uh, came up as a, an interesting thing, uh, two uh, young people uh, arrived, Fujita and, and Saito. They both came from uh, Japan, and they, they wanted a project. The, what the Japanese at that time were doing is they gave uh, young professors, faculty members, three years or so into their careers, as faculty members, a year off to travel somewhere in the world and learn something new, do something different. So that was when Japanese industry was very healthy and expanding. And so we had these two young professors, they came, they didn't know each other, but they both were Japanese and could speak to each other in their own language. And so they wound up on my doorstep and uh, they wanted to do something. And so we had the idea, suppose you could make this thing, would it be interesting? Oh. And so they came up with, um, let's see, I think I have, should have something about this. Maybe that's, it's not here. Well, they came up with the idea 
that if you join this and you put just a few atoms, there would be uh, uh, quantized states. And these quantized states, uh, if they had cones, like you have in the Dirac cones, uh, you could have an, an occupation at the Dirac point or not. If you had an occupation at the Dirac point, you'd have metallic too. Otherwise, you have semiconducting too. So that was the, uh, uh, the gist, uh, the content of this paper that, that we wrote in 1992, saying, gee, this is a pretty interesting thing if you can make it. Let's try and uh, maybe, just depending on the chirality of the hexagons, the orientation of the hexagons relative to the axis, you would have different metallicities. Wouldn't that be interesting? So anyway, that was a proposition. And then, of course, people actually did the experiment. And uh, yes, you can have metal in semiconducting nanotubes. And that was how that all started. So um, now we want us to see um, uh, spectroscopically what that meant. So what are the energy levels? So you have a quantum system in, in a nanotube and um, uh, you can get very large enhancements because you have a nanostructure and if you're in resonance with some energy level of a nanostructure, just by the uh, spikes in the density of states, uh, you could have very, very large enhancements. So, um, so we tried doing the spectroscopy and that's work of Peter Eklund and uh, uh, A.M. Rao, that's this work here. And uh, yes, depending on the excitation energy, we got totally different um, uh, features for the G-band. So that's where two atoms are vibrating, optical mode like that. Very simple concept. Uh, but they were resonant uh, very differently depending on how the uh, hexagons were oriented. It's a very interesting idea. And we could predict how that uh, worked out and that gave the chirality of the tubes, you know, basically. So that was a, a very interesting point. And the diameter of the tube could be measured by this feature here, the radial breathing mode, where all the atoms were breathing in and out. So um, that was interesting. And the big uh, multiplication factors that we got because of the low dimensionality of the system suggested, well, we should go maybe uh, uh, to smaller and smaller systems. And uh, that uh, suggested maybe try just one nanotube, see if you get anything. That's a good experiment. And so um, up the street at Harvard, um, uh, Charlie Lieber and his group made, made the sample for us. And uh, then we took some individual tubes out there and measured them and could see uh, the spectrum for just one tube. And that opened single nanotube spectroscopy and then single molecule spectroscopy and all of that. Uh, uh, came along, and so um, uh, nanoscience has really benefited from all of those ideas and the fact that in low dimensions the physics changes and we could take advantage of that to do experiments that we couldn't otherwise do, like resonance, large enhancement factors, polarization effects, all kind of interesting things. And uh, so that was uh, work of the 1990s. Uh, in the 1990s, we should go back to von Hippel, where he, where he fits into this picture, because this is von Hippel lecture. Uh, in the 1990s, um, von Hippel was in his 90s, and in the early 1990s, he followed this work, and when we talked to him, he didn't actually, he stopped working at just about 90. He, left it. he was working in the laboratory like every day, until he was about that age. And then uh, he was more listening and would come in more occasionally. But he was really interested in the work that the young people were doing. And so uh, that's a good role model for all of us that when we retire, just to remain interesting. Maybe you live to 105 in good health as he did. Uh, well, what we're doing now is we uh, are studying double wall nanotubes and triple wall nanotubes and have all kind of interesting things. And um, 
One of the interesting things for me about this is that we use graphene as a model system to teach us uh, uh, what is really happening. So, um, for example, if you take two layers and you twist them, uh, then interesting moiré patterns, we've heard a lot about that at the, at the conference here up till this point. Uh, but when you have a double wall nanotube, it occurs naturally because the hexagons will be, have this kind of relation and then you can move them, telescope one inside the other and um, study different aspects about that. And then you have in addition the metallicity, uh, different possibilities. And things get even more interesting when you have triple wall tubes. We don't go beyond triple wall tubes because that gets a little somewhat complicated. But uh, triple wall tubes can be uh, handled pretty well in the laboratory now. And um, this is kind of a frontier area. There aren't too many people studying this. And um, uh, interesting effects with, can be seen. You can make nice tubes. Um, and uh, what we would like to do now with this is take some particular tube and put it inside different environments and see what uh, the environment does. And that could have some interesting applications and you could use sensors for that. So I, th I think that that's um, a future direction. And there's so sort of what the idea is. One single wall, double wall, triple wall have the same tube in different orientations and see what happens. And uh, some early work that, that will encourage you that this thing, whole thing makes sense is uh, uh, you see here uh, double wall and triple wall tubes are sort of uh, mounted together. There's some small difference between them. And there's a difference between bundle tubes, that is you have a, different tubes next to each other interacting, or you have them all to totally separated and you look at individuals. And uh, that's shown in a view graph like this. So there's systematics you could see. And uh, the details of that are not yet worked out, but um, if you, you're careful, you can learn things about this. So let me just move uh, to the next phase. Uh, the story of nanocarbons, um, we had fullerenes and nanotubes, and this field is still very active, so it's not finished. Uh, graphene, which was first paper in graphene was 1960, but it reemerged with uh, Novoselov and Geim when they actually made a single layer. And they could characterize it and show all the beautiful new physics. So the 1960 work was just identifying. So this is 1960 work. And um, the author of this, um, Hans Peter Böhm, is still alive. And he swears by this paper. So, uh, and, uh, so he observed this effect, but he didn't know what to do with it. He didn't really pursue it. So, uh, so for the young people, it's good to, uh, to discover something, but it's even better to stick with it and show what it's good for. So, um, now graphene is a big topic at this conference, uh, much more so than nanotubes, although people are, are actually publishing lots of papers on nanotubes even now. Uh, but uh, graphene has very interesting properties. The carbon-carbon bond is the strongest bond in nature, so you can make very strong materials. We know that we wouldn't have a space industry without uh, that carbon-carbon bond. It just wouldn't happen. So uh, this is very important to know and understand and control. And the linear dispersion gives you uh, new electronic properties, and you can have a very, very high mobilities because in the carbon system you can make these hexagons without very many defects and you can get mobilities. Well, people have 100,000 centimeter uh, volt second, so you can have all kind of uh, wonderful things. Uh, some of the other properties just come from carbon systems like very high uh, 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 thermal conductivity, um, the possibility of, of having high current densities, 
flex, flexible, flexible material, just a single wall. And um, so it's such a simple system. One kind of atom, all carbon, and a two atoms per unit cell. What can, it's hard to imagine anything much simpler than that, and that's the hexagonal structure that we um, have known for, for many years. Um, so single and double layer, uh, and monolayer and bilayer, in big picture, large wave vectors look almost the same, but on a small scale, where the Fermi level is right here, uh, one layer gives linear E versus K, and two layers give quadratic. So in, in the, uh, when you look at it on the small scale, uh, they are very different. Uh, and if you have very few carriers, carrier density in the system is low, so you stay very close to the Dirac point, so um, it makes a difference. And so we have something like that as for the uh, dispersion relations for the single and bilayer graphene. Now in terms of spectroscopy, the uh, uh, spectra are really unique. Um, that is, monolayer uh, has um, a triple resonance everything about this effect is very resonant and that's why the second order effect usually when we do perturbation theory second order effects are smaller than first order effects but if everything is resonant and in this case the scattering is back and forth so you have a triple resonance you can get a huge enhancement factor so um, uh, that makes the system kind of interesting and uh, gives you a calibration point of when you have isolated layers and when you don't. And um, one thing that, that's nice about um, a carbon system and the simplicity of it is that you can study wave ve vector dependent phenomena. There's very few systems that you can really do this quantitatively. So uh, with spectroscopy, this can be done. And uh, so you excite this wave vector, Q, blue, and um, then with a different laser energy for excitation, you can get totally different uh, uh, resonance, but also a different wave vector. And um, so this allows you wave vector control and control of phenomena that's, that have to do with wave vectors. So this has been a very interesting part of, of the nanostructures. And um, uh, can't do this on, on, on all systems, but it allows you can some control on phonons, which uh, has made carbon systems another interesting thing. And they have a, a very long excited state, um, so-called G-band. And that's another uh, unusual thing and gives rise to this uh, extraordinarily large thermal conductivity that we heard about one of the prize winners uh, um, is, has done important work in that area. So um, there are two things that one can do to study all these kinds of systems. And I just bring this in as a comment that if you change the Fermi level, that's sort of like doping. And control change of Fermi level is very important in study properties of materials. And with carbon, that's an interesting thing to, to do. And you can do it with gates external gates, you could do it electrochemically, you could do it with chemical doping, three different ways. And they're all a little different. You learn something different in each case. So, uh, and well, this, this shows sometimes there, everything is allowed with certain laser lines, and sometimes um, it's not allowed because you don't have an initial state occupied or the final state is blocked or something like that. And you could study all kinds of, of systems like that. Another thing that you could do is you could do isotope effects. Uh, uh, I, ha I haven't heard very much about isotope effects here, but isotopes are really powerful. And in carbon, you have C12 and C13. C13 is um, uh, just a couple of percent abundant, but then you can add some isotopes of your own and uh, vary that and, and use that as an agent. So that helps you um, uh, separate phenomena that have to do with the electronic transport from the phonons. So um, isotopes are really valuable, and I think that um, uh, material science should be 
making more use of them for scientific and probably practical applications. So this is, you can tell uh, uh, what's happening in surface effects. You can have uh, environmental effects because you can separate all of that. If you have two layers, you can know which is the top and the bottom. Put C12, C13. So that sort of thing uh, can be done. And you could um, uh, also look at localization effects. This is something. What happens if you have a C12 and next to a C13? That's, uh, uh, does that make a big difference whether you have or not? It's not going to change the electronic properties very much, but the phonons will change quite a bit. And uh, so you can study lifetimes of these kinds of states. Um, so uh, now I've, I've finished my uh, final topic. Um, we got interested about, oh, 15 years ago, 19, late 1990s, and um, people like to show this um, uh, photogenic slide because it's, so this is a ribbon and um, so the first idea is maybe if you make a ribbon it could be interesting um, so suppose you have a zigzag ribbon or an armchair ribbon those are the two um, high, de high uh, symmetry states and uh, it turns out when you actually make uh, ribbons in, in laboratory they like to be like this and they don't like to have mixtures so uh, this kind of sample uh, actually is realistic and can be studied. And, and people have been studying especially magnetic properties of these things. And this has become uh, quite an um, important topic in recent years. And so um, what the interest is that a zigzag uh, uh, ribbon will have a very high density of states at the Fermi level. And independent of the diameter, they all have that property. But the uh, armchair are like nanotubes. They could be either metallic or semiconducting, depending on um, the width of the ribbon. So, and you can control that and actually measure that. So you can make the ribbon that you like and, and, um, and sustain it and see what the properties are. So um, there are some old ribbons, 10 years old, but uh, uh, people now make them by all kind of means. And um, so you can study them, characterize them, study polarization effects and all kinds of things like that. Spectroscopically, emission, all kinds of experiments have been done. And uh, this is the final thing that I have to say about it that, that uh, we've been getting interested in recently is combining uh, thermal uh, studies with electronic studies. So um, if you uh, put a voltage across um, uh, a ribbon like this, you can get pretty high current flowing. You can get uh, heat generated. You have a thermal energy trans transfer and you can anneal a sample. And, you can get to 2,000 degrees with carbon uh, without working too hard in your laboratory, just IV characteristics. And you can transform properties of, of materials from kind of disorder to much more ordered. And this is an example of, of one that, that um, was made by a graduate student in her thesis. So uh, that's shown with a microscope TEM picture. And Another thing that um, is interesting is using an electron beam or IV. It could be done with IV characteristics, just getting things warm, and joining nanotubes. So this is in the literature uh, uh, already, and, um, but this kind of uh, idea could be generalized, and more things can be done with this direction. So um, we, we're doing some work in this direction and many other people are doing also. Uh, so I just go back to uh, our inspiration, Arthur von Hippel. Uh, so he dropped out of the picture just before graphene. So he passed away in 2003 and 2004 graphene hit the, the scene in, in uh, full swing. And uh, he missed all of that. So, uh, but 
let him rest in peace. He did a lot in his lifetime, and um, I think he was an inspiration for many people. And at the MRS conference every year, we have Van, uh, Van Hippel winner, and uh, it's nice to think of the old man himself and uh, what he would have thought of the research that we present every year. And since I knew him quite well, I thought I would say something about him and his legacy. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Millie, for a great inspirational talk and for your career and for what you mean for the MRS. Is there any question or comment? I would like to ask you a question in relation to Von Hippel. Yeah. Any particular uh, memory that you have of his inspiration to you? Uh, yes, I, I was trying to say in the beginning that uh, if you did something that was kind of weird and different, uh, some people would say, what are you wasting your time doing that? But that was not von Hippel. He would listen to you and ask first question, why are you doing this? And then you'd have a conversation. And then he would be brought into the conversation. And he had a very broad interest as I said, and uh, he would comment on what you're doing. So, uh, and he, he was interested in all fields of materials research. You know? He had that, I, I would say that that was the, the most memorable part about him, anything that you did, and the more different it was from anything that you heard before, <laughs> the more interested he was in it. Yeah. Any other um, question, please? Also, an, a rather non-technical question. So you mentioned at the beginning that you had great mentors throughout, or in the beginning of your career, and then Arthur von Hippel later. And um, of course, we all know that you have been yourself a great mentor to, to many of, of your students. And so my question is, what's your advice on, on mentoring young scientists and, uh, and PhD students? And do you think there's a difference in mentoring female and male students or, or scientists? OK. Uh, well, let, let me start out about mentoring. Mentoring is important, and I think mentoring is a lot more important now than it was when I was young, in the following sense. Uh, see how many people are here? Uh, uh, people worry about whether they'll have careers because they see so many people coming to the conference, and they, they try to do some numerical estimates of, can I get a job working in this uh, field? And the answer is, Yes, uh, somehow materials can be used in so many different uh, 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 venues. And, uh, well, uh, students start out in academia. Uh, maybe the number of jobs in, in academia is not infinite, uh, but there are many things that you could do with a career, a, a, a training in materials uh, that are valuable. We just have to look at Von Hippel. Uh, he's a real inspiration on this because um, different parts of his career, he was uh, helping the government make this or make that, and he was involved with the radar project, how materials could implement uh, radar use. Uh, and he found that very interesting because there was interesting science that could be found th that would interest him while people were interested in the outcome. So, so that, that's the answer to the first part of the question. And uh, um, uh, I think that uh, senior people, certainly education um, and materials research is for the students. And, it's, and people sometimes when they uh, are professors, they think it's for them, but it's, we're working for the students rather than uh, the students working for us, I think, because they're going to be 
uh, the next generation and we have to train them uh, to be successful and advance the field. Thank you. So that, that, that's my idea about mentoring. You have to give them courage to go on with it. Please. So, Billy, I have a technical question. I've heard a lot about strain engineering and Symposium YY to make boring materials do interesting things. And it seems that with carbon being so strong that you might be able to put a lot of strain into it. Oh, yeah. What's the prospects for doing band engineering uh, with these carbon Well, materials? there's quite a lot of work done in strain. Uh, and you can do uh, a tensile, you can stretch. And so that, yes, the bond is very strong, but you can change. And uh, experiments uh, on uh, uh, behavior of electronic properties, magnetic properties, you just name it, under strain, is a very interesting thing. And it's just like changing the Fermi level. Uh, you change something about the lattice constant or the symmetry of the of the structure with strain. So it's a valuable tool scientifically and it might even produce some interesting uh, applications as you can imagine, strain gauges, whatever. Um, Please. Good, good direction, good question. Um, did Professor Von Hippel have any jokes or quotes you particularly like to uh, tell the young people? Yeah, jokes. Oh, well, uh, yes. Uh, he was interested in jokes, but I can't remember any of the jokes that all these. Uh, uh, Please. Yeah. Life, life ha it can't be serious all the time. So, and and uh, uh, I, I would say that uh, he was a man that enjoyed life. And so making a joke is part of enjoying life. Please. So it seems like you are the only woman uh, winning this award. Tell us no, your... No, I'm not the only one. Some other people have. Well, okay. But um, tell us your experience about women in science uh, oh. since you started, because I've read a little bit about your history and you've... Okay. Uh, there are two comments I, I make. Women and men do the same science. So, you know, we have the same standards and we... And we have to measure up. And so there's no, no, no difference in the science. And uh, now the, the other thing is in the classroom, um, I think that women professors sometimes are a little motherly with the students. Uh, when, when we have students with some kind of personal problems, uh, We'll take time out to listen to them because we have our children and we've gone through this with them. And, and sometimes some personal attention can change the careers of people because they're undergoing some local problem and we listen to them, encourage them, they move on. And uh, there is a small difference between men and women that I've found over the years that before they even get, the women get to the college level, they have, many of them have been discouraged in their careers. What, do you, what is a pretty girl like you studying physics for? <laughs> so uh, we get a lot of that. And uh, so how do we, how do we deal, deal with it? Um, there's a, a private life that, that you can have, and there's a professional life. And we have to uh, train our young women to be able to handle both and be happy, and not to have to say, oh, just because I'm uh, um, getting a PhD in material science, for example, uh, that closes my life as uh, family person. It, it's all compatible to combine the two. And maybe female faculty members can be specially useful uh, in showing how they did it because everybody has their own tricks of how they balance careers and family. So it can be done. <laughs> 
I heard you had a great nanny, right? That's what you said. Yeah, well, I, 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 she, I didn't have a nanny. I had a babysitter, a babysitter. Uh, who had five children of her own and um, had no professional training. And she loved kids, and she helped me with mine, my four. And, uh, and then I had, during the day, I was in the lab. And we had a great uh, relation for 29 years. We worked together. So we were both happy with the situation. And with that wonderful remark, we would like to present to you this honor for your many contributions to the MRS. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming to this wonderful night to honor Millet Dressler. Thank you. Thank you for coming.